Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, good, good evening, or wherever you may be in Zoom land. Um, welcome. My name is Tokumbo Gumfumi. I work here at Accra University as a professor of electrical and computer engineering. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this inaugural um, SCU School of Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. It's the last week of class here. So it's a busy time for everybody. So I want to really appreciate you for joining us, even though it's a busy time for you. Um, the DEI Distinguished Lecture is a new lecture series approved by the Dean of Engineering, Elaine Scott, as part of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Program Initiative at Sanaka University. And the goal of the program is to invite successful distinguished underrepresented minorities who are engineers or scientists in their, in their fields as role models to give a university-wide lecture. We want to expand the picture of success. And it can be a challenge for students to envision their own careers, success without seeing leaders like them in prominent positions. So the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Distinguished Lecture Series shines a light on what's possible we want to be able to showcase these success stories and inspire the next generation of Santa Clara STEM professionals. Of course, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math with quarterly presentations by successful underrepresented minorities in engineering. So we hope to have guest lecturers from industry, from academia, from research to come share their experiences of overcoming obstacles, their lessons they learned on their journey and in their careers and offer thoughts to us on how to increase diversity, equity and inclusion in STEM. So we're quite honored today to have Dr. Gary S. May, the seventh chancellor of the University of California Davis to give today's inaugural distinguished lecture. We're also very excited to have Father Kevin O'Brien the 29th president of Santa Clara University to, in attendance to welcome you all and to give his opening remarks. And we are glad to have the provost, Lisa Kloppenberg in attendance, as well as the Dean of the School of Engineering, Elaine Scott. You will hear from all of them in a few minutes, but I will now invite Father Kevin O'Brien to offer his remarks and to welcome the distinguished speaker as well as all the guests. Father O'Brien. Well, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for your leadership in uh, in, in gathering us together for this uh, important series. Uh, very excited to join you again today. You know, as you know, Santa Clara is so deeply committed to both um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as to our to engineering and STEM education. And we are very excited about the opening of the Sobrado campus in the fall, but even more important than the building, however beautiful and innovative it is, are the people that are in it. And as we well know, the more diverse the people are that are that, that we gathered in our classrooms and laboratories, the better we are as a university and better we are as people. So really DEI, DEI is not just something you check off on a list of things to do, but really is should be constitutive of, of who we are as a university because it makes us better. Um, and so it's always important for us to learn from other leaders and other universities as to um, how we can best put DEI practices into effect on our campus. So really delighted to have Gary uh, May join us from UC Davis. Uh, as I was sharing earlier with him, uh, you know, I, I admire him, his leadership from afar down here in the, in the Silicon Valley as he does such great work up at UC Davis. Uh, and, he's, and he's been a leader in diversity and STEM education for a very long time as well as many other accomplishments in higher ed, particularly in leading such a, um, uh, a campus as large and as innovative as UC Davis. So really happy to have uh, uh, Professor May, Dr. May here with us. So thank you for spending time with us and a welcome to all of you. Thank you. The Provost Lisa, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Doctor. Chancellor May, we're very honored to have you with us today. We're so grateful for your time and expertise. 
my father was an electrical engineer who always tinkered with circuit boards in his garage. So I'm just so impressed your deep scholarly contributions as well as your extensive service to engineering and higher education. I also have been watching UC Davis's trajectory under your leadership. You fostered excellence in research while making the university more diverse and inclusive. You build, of course, upon UC Davis's long and rich history of producing distinguished graduates, including the two deans at Santa Clara who are collaborating to leading us to even greater prominence in STEM education and research. And I'm now proud to ask one of your Aggies to speak next, Dean Elaine Scott of our School of Engineering. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, very much. And thank you. Welcome, everyone. And particularly, I just want to make uh, say thank you to Dr. Ogunfumi and Ricky and Nicole and the rest of the communications team for helping to put this on. And Chancellor May, it's, it's, we're very honored to have you here to help launch this distinguished lecture series. And um, as uh, they've noted that there are a number of things that we're doing in the school to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is part of that overall effort. And again, this is especially a privilege to me as a proud Aggie um, to have you here. And I look forward again to seeing you at the football games and hopefully we'll have a good season. Um, but your leadership at Davis has just been absolutely remarkable. And just, I'm very proud to see it as one of the most prominent and diverse institutions in the country, if not the world. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your comments today. Thank you very much, Lane. We appreciate all the welcome greetings. Um, so it's come back to me now to introduce the speaker today. Uh, bear with me, I'm going to read some of the <laughs> huge accomplishments he's done. Uh, we at Santa Clara are very glad to have Chancellor Gary May kick off our School of Engineering, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Distinguished Lecture Series. Chancellor May is a highly engaged leader with a passion for helping others succeed. He believes success is best judged by how we enhance the lives of others. Throughout his career, he's championed diversity, equity, and inclusion in both higher education and the workplace. He's developed nationally recognized programs that attract, mentor, and retain under, underrepresented groups in the STEM fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. Chancellor May believes in the positive impact of academia and industry have when they partner together for the common good. He launched Aggie Square in April, 2018 to support economic growth in Sacramento and help create jobs at a variety of education levels. And in November, 2019, Chancellor May and Sacramento Mayor Daryl Steinberg was recognized with a leadership award from the Association of University Research Parks for creating a unique partnership for Aggie Square. And in 2015, President Obama honored him with the Presidential Award for Excellence in STEM Mentoring. And just last year, he received the prestigious Lifetime Mentor Award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science for demonstrating extraordinary leadership to increase participation of underrepresented groups in the fields of science and engineering. Gary May was inducted to the National Academy of Engineering in September 2018 for his successful diversity efforts and his innovations in semiconductor manufacturing. And in April of 2020, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences for education, educational and academic leadership. He's a prominent voice in higher education. He's a commissioner of the National Council on Competitiveness. He serves as vice chair of the University's Research Association Council of Presidents and sits on the executive committee of the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities Board of Directors. I could go on and on. <laughs> But let me just say his vision as UC Davis's seventh chancellor is to lead the university to new heights in academic excellence, inclusion, public service, and upward mobility for students from all backgrounds. He previously served as Dean of Georgia Tech's College of Engineering, the largest and most diverse school of its kind in the nation. And 
I serve here at Tanakara as the faculty advisor to the National Society of Black Engineers. And many of you know NSBE is, the mission of NSBE is to increase the number of culturally responsible black engineers who excel academically, succeed professionally, and positively impact the community. So we are committed here at Santa Clara to fulfill the mission of NSBE. And every year we take a group of students to attend the NSBE National Convention. In one of those conventions, I attended a networking forum organized by Dr. Beverly Wetford of Georgia, uh, Virginia Tech. And at that forum, there were lots of mentees of Dr. Gary May, many of who are now faculty members at different universities and some are working in industry. I was very, very impressed at the professional network that he has built with his former students and colleagues and mentees. They all love him and hold him in high esteem. And at that time, I also attended another session of the engineering deans where he was a member of the panel discussing innovative ways to increase the number of underrepresented minorities in STEM. At that time, he was the Dean of the College of Engineering at Georgia Tech. I was very, very impressed by the ideas from the various universities, including Georgia Tech and what they have done on this important issue. I hope he will be able to share with us some of those ideas in his comments today. Chancellor May earned his master's and PhD degrees in electrical and computer engineering, electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley. He's won numerous awards for his research in computer-aided manufacturing of integrated circuits. He traces his interest in engineering back to his childhood Lego and Erector sets, along with Star Trek and science fiction heroes like Iron Man. He lives in Davis with his wife, Rochelle, who is in our own right, a software engineer for CNN. Please join me in welcoming Chancellor Gary May to give us the distinguished lecture today. Well, thank you uh, to Kunbo for the very kind uh, invitation to speak as well as the very generous introduction. I'm very happy to be here. If you give me just a second, I'll share my screen and uh, pull my slides up here. Oops. Let's see, it didn't work yet. Let me see if I can try one more time. There we go. There we are. Okay. Um, let me first just acknowledge uh, the leadership at Santa Clara University who's uh, joined us, uh, including uh, President uh, Kevin O'Brien and Provost Lisa Kloppenberg and, and uh, Engineering Dean Elaine Scott Goags. Uh, thank all of you for being here and creating a forum for honest conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I'm always thrilled to speak uh, with and learn from other organizations that I believe share the same values that we have at UC Davis. And I know that Santa Clara University is doing excellent work to further social justice and, and combat racism. So I applaud your efforts uh, in these areas. You know, academic leaders, we're in a unique position um, to, to uh, bring access, opportunity, and advancement to our students and our, our communities. And that's really how we build a better tomorrow. And I, you know, we unfortunately right now live deeply uh, in a deeply polarized time and must confront issues of social justice and equity in order to move forward. So it's important that we talk about these issues openly, even if it's sometimes a little uncomfortable. Um, events of the past year or so have only reaffirm the need to build an inclusive society that recognizes and respects people of all backgrounds and experiences. I'm talking about the disproportionate negative impact of the pandemic on people of color, uh, and importantly also the nationwide unrest uh, and protests following the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis last May. You know, George Floyd was uh, one of a long list of uh, black men and women whose lives were tragically cut short. Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, Oscar Grant, Stephon Clark, the list goes on. Uh, Michael Brown, uh, who was an 18 year old young man who was fatally shot uh, by police in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. Well, that incident uh, happened just two miles from where I grew up in St. Louis. So uh, all of this is uh, its home. Um, you know, each time when one of these incidents occurs, I thought that could have been me. Uh, you know, at a traffic stop, 
Uh, no one knows I'm the chancellor of UC Davis. No one knows I have a PhD. Uh, sometimes it's just death by a thousand cuts. Uh, there are many microaggressions that we all experience. Sometimes you may become numb to them, but then something like a George Floyd happens and it brings all of those feelings back to the forefront. Uh, you think about all the times when you were treated in a questionable or a different way and you wonder, was that because I'm black or is that just the normal way of behaving around here? And you never really know the answer to that because in America, we undergo these sorts of situations all the time. And I'll just quote James Baldwin, uh, who said in 1961 about being black in America, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a state of rage almost all of the time. And I think we've all felt that way. Baldwin also argued that a complex, complex thing can't really be made simple. Fundamentally, I think that's the challenge of diversity, equity, and inclusion at work today. It's in 2021, it's a tall order to tackle a problem that's persisted for so long. We need a wide range of initiatives to address the inequities that persist for women and people of color, especially in the STEM fields. And it's gonna take a long time term commitment. Still, I think we have a unique opportunity uh, in this moment uh, to create change. All across the country, we've heard these uh, calls for social justice. And in these polarizing times, embracing diversity and inclusion is central to our humanity and our progress as a society. And each one of us must do what we can where we are to eliminate racism, sexism, and other negative influences on uh, our evolution as a nation. And, and to be clear, I, you know, when I refer to diversity, I'm talking about the full range of, of nationalities, the full spectrum of socioeconomic uh, class, the and cultural backgrounds, I mean, varying political views, gender identities, and a rich diversity of talents and skill sets. In a moment, I'll talk more about diversity and inclusion and why it matters. But first, I just wanna share some of my own personal journey through life and leadership. So let me just take you back for a moment. And I mean, all the way back to the beginning, uh, that's me. Um, uh, and uh, I, I was born in St. Louis uh, and raised by my parents, Gloria and Warren. Um, they, you know, I came from a very humble background. Uh, my mom spent 40 years uh, teaching in St. Louis public schools, and my father was a postal worker. Uh, he didn't actually earn a degree until, until later in life. Um, I, uh, here I am as a teenager with mom and dad. And by the way, Father O'Brien, I went to Catholic school. So uh, <laughs> this picture was taken in the late 70s. Uh, mom remains a great source of inspiration. My father unfortunately passed away. Um, uh, in the early 2000s, but mom was something of a, of a groundbreaker. She um, was among the first group of students to integrate the University of Missouri back in the 1950s during Jim Crow. Uh, seems like that was a long time ago to our students, but you know, it was just one generation removed uh, from me. Uh, and when my mom showed up at the dorms for the first time at Missouri, um, the house mother got very upset. She didn't like the fact that a black girl was gonna be living there. Uh, she even questioned where mom was going to shower, uh, but mom said, uh, uh, "Well, don't worry, it's not going to it's not going to wash off." Uh, so that kind of gives you a feel for her her attitude. Uh, she never gave up, uh, despite the kind of hateful language and adversity she faced there, and she didn't let anything get in the way of her earning her degree in education, where she went on to become a teacher. Uh, I think a lot about how America has not made uh, as much progress as we'd like to have made or, or we often claim to have made. You know, when I started at Georgia Tech as an undergraduate, I had my own similar moments. In fact, when I moved into the dormitory my first day, uh, written on the name card of my roommate, uh, his name was Chip, uh, was uh, Chip is an N-word lover on his name card. Uh, so that's pretty disconcerting your first day moving in to see something like that in your, in your room on your roommate's uh, name card. So mom and dad were very nervous and anxious about this. But I figured, well, you know, I, it could be worse. I could be rooming with the person who wrote this rather than Chip. So uh, I looked at them on the bright side. And so I took it in stride in similar to way, the way mom did. Uh, so I stayed focused, learned to rise above the adversity. I, and I still tell students today, uh, you just can't let the bigots win. It's just not, not tenable. Um, so um, I was lucky to have an affinity for math and science. Uh, I often credit my early love of Lego and erector sets, as you heard in the introduction, for sparking the engineer in me. I, I didn't realize it at the time, 
but I was uh, snapping those blocks together and assembling those metal beams and building the foundation of, of my engineering career. Um, and then once I discovered Star Trek, uh, uh, my imagination went to warp speed, if you will. Uh, I saw spaceships, I saw fantastic uh, gadgets like phasers and teleportation devices and tricorders. And in fact, the first time any of us saw a flip phone was on Star Trek. Um, my fellow Trekkers will, will know that the, the, even the pad devices they used, the crew used, uh, look a lot like the tablets that we use today. Um, and when I wasn't watching Star Trek, I spent a lot of my childhood, childhood reading comics. Uh, I learned about the heroes and their superpowers. Uh, fun fact, I actually have over 13,000 comic books in my collection and I still collect today. Um, you know, of course, superpowers were, were cool. You know, the Black Panther suit is made of vibranium, a metal that can store and transform energy. Iron Man's suit uh, features AI thrusters, weapons. And many of us engineers, uh, whether we admit it or not, we all wanted to build an Iron Man suit. That's why we became an uh, engineer. Uh, I was a little bit short on capital to make that happen, but uh, that was the uh, aspiration. But more importantly, um, the, you know, the X-Men and the Avengers and the Justice League uh, use their powers for good. Uh, and that continues to appeal to me even today. In fact, some superhero qualities uh, influence my leadership style and my way of life. You know, I try to use my powers uh, for good and make the world a better place and help others to succeed. Higher education uh, can do more than train and educate our students. We, I believe we can empower our students like the superheroes to be agents of their own success, uh, their career and their destiny and to, and to do some good in the world. After all, the world could use uh, more heroes and, and fewer villains. Um, I credit these things for leading me to become an engineer, Lego and Erector Sets, Talent in Math and Science, and, and comic book superheroes and Star Trek episodes that sparked my curiosity and uh, about how things work. And with this combination of interests, it's not surprising that my engineering career focused on integrated circuits, uh, the hearts and brains of computers, mobile devices, and other electronics. My research uh, focused on computer-aided manufacturing of ICs. Uh, I've written or contributed to more than 300 articles and presentations on this topic and uh, even served once as an editor-in-chief for one of the IEEE journals. Uh, and I'm quite proud of uh, engineering, uh, uh, pioneering use of AI uh, to, to improve chip making that uh, makes use uh, of um, that technique to make processes more efficient, which is one of the things that our, our group contributed to the field over the years. Um, but another more important or equally important focus of my career has been working to increase diversity in STEM. Um, so um, even today, you know, people don't expect to see people like me or like Takumbo uh, in STEM or higher education leadership, certainly, right? You just don't find uh, many black men with PhDs in engineering. You don't find black men who lead major research universities. You don't find enough black scientists. When I finished grad school at, in Ber at Berkeley in 1991, 30 years ago now, um, I was one of about 30 African-Americans that year to get a PhD in engineering in the United States. That's 30 in the entire United States. So you could put us all in one classroom. Uh, the numbers are still uh, quite abysmal. Um, uh, African-Americans earn between three to 4% of the PhDs, combined PhDs in math, computer science, and engineering in the US and unfortunately this lack of representation also applies to women and other minority populations uh, in STEM fields. Um, Underrepresentation in STEM has been one of the most intractable problems in our nation for many years. Um, there are many reasons one might argue that diversity in STEM is an imperative. There's certainly social, certainly social equity, there's closing the pay gap, there's graduating enough STEM grads to meet projected workforce demands and competitiveness issues. I've got a more practical argument, however. I would contend that diversity is at the root of innovation and technical advancement. The, the greater diversity we have, the more likely we can make discoveries and solve problems. A wide mix of backgrounds, experiences, and ideas really helps make that happen. Um, diversity drives innovation uh, in our increasingly global workforce. And without it, we see sometimes design flaws in our innovations that forget women and people of color. And I'll just give a couple of examples. Uh, the first airbags in the automobile industry almost killed women passengers. Why? Well, because they were tested on crash test dummies that had male anatomies, which were taller and bigger. And when they deployed, they hit the women passengers in the face and snapped their necks back. Um, uh, in some restrooms, 
if you if I put my hands under the automated faucet, faucet uh, with my palms down, um, I don't get soap or water. And that's because the sensors uh, are not calibrated properly for the pigment in my skin. Um, and uh, some AI algorithms uh, used for image recognition, facial recognition, have racial and gender biases. You know, a recent study found that people of color are more likely to actually be hit by driverless cars. That's because the imaging algorithms in the vehicles can better detect pedestrians with lighter skin than those of us with darker skin. Um, one final quick example, um, you've heard about the, the pulse oximeters that are used uh, uh, for uh, measuring uh, uh, oxygen uh, in COVID-19 patients uh, to monitor oxygen uh, saturation at home. Uh, another recent study has shown that these devices are less accurate when, with uh, people with darker skin. Uh, I said one more, but I'll just give one more quick one. We're all using proctoring software and remote learning, right? And even the proctoring software that we're using is having trouble identifying our students of darker complexion. Uh, so th these things are uh, problematic um, across the board. And there's just a few examples, but they, I think they make the clear point that diversity as a practical matter uh, actually leads to better outcomes. If there were more diverse engineers on these design teams and all these examples, I would contend that they may not have overlooked the glitches that we have observed in these particular products. Um, and it's not more engineers that lead to more innovation. I, I would say that it's more diverse engineers that lead to more and better innovations. So, you know, how, how can we increase diversity in our STEM fields? How can we attract and retain uh, students, faculty, and staff uh, from various backgrounds? Let me just try to share a few ideas that I have. Um, one is, First and foremost, I believe that diversity is everybody's job. Uh, it requires commitment from across an organization, including the highest levels uh, of leadership and all the, way, all the way down. And it needs to be a long-term commitment. Many of us, especially in academia, have some work to do. And that work is to reflect the demographics of our increasingly diverse student population. If you look at the University of California, for example, across our 10 campuses, nearly 70% of tenured faculty are white. Uh, about 17% are Asian, 7% are Latina, uh, Latin or Latinx, and 3% are African American. So, um, um, coincidentally, by the way, some, some of the uh, STEM fields look fairly similar to that example that I just gave. And you see, the UC, especially in computer science and engineering, that's not a surprise to any, this audience at all. Now, if you compare that uh, demographic, demographic uh, 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 distribution to our public schools in California, more than half of K-12 public school students in our state are, are Hispanic or Latinx. Uh, the diversity of our university and higher education institutions across California really must and should uh, serve the rich diversity in our state better. Um, uh, so in 2018, UC Davis launched a uh, major effort uh, to increase faculty diversity. It involved committing more than $7 million to annually uh, expand existing programs uh, to, to uh, increase and maintain faculty diversity. Uh, and we're making some progress thanks to support from National Science Foundation grants and, and some from the UC system via the Advancing Faculty Diversity Program. Uh, uh, we've, we've been able to, uh, re first of all, require applicants for faculty positions to submit um, statements describing how they will contribute to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And next, we are training people involved in, in faculty recruitment and in hiring. We've trained more than 30, 1,300 faculty members on implicit bias and, and breast pack practices for uh, new faculty recruitment. And this is a faculty-led training effort that we call STED, which stands for Strength Through Equity and Diversity. Um, in 2012, UC Davis received an NSF Advanced Institutional Transformation grant to expand the ranks of women and underrepresented faculty. We had some success in institutionalizing two effective programs that originated from that grant. One of these is our Center for the Advancement of Multicultural Perspectives on Science, or CAMPOS, which has successfully recruited 30 uh, faculty scholars engaged in promoting diversity in STEM. And CAMPOS was so successful that we added a second uh, center, which we call Camp SA, and that's our Center for the Advancement of Multicultural Perspectives in Social Science, Arts, and Humanities. So we have the STEM fields as well as the social sciences and humanities. 
So importantly, scholars from both of these programs fill a much needed pipeline of diverse talent uh, for our workforce, our faculty workforce and our research labs uh, in our university. Uh, next, I wanna just talk about how diversity initiatives must be linked to business strategies and, and they need metrics and other measures of accountability to be effective. At UC Davis, diversity is written into our strategic plan. One of our strategic goals is to make UC Davis a model uh, for diversity and inclusion among higher education institutions. Uh, we created a vice chancellor for diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, sits in the cabinet and reports to me. And uh, now uh, that office has a team that's dedicated to recruiting and retaining the best and brightest students, faculty, and staff. Coincident, uh, let's see. Uh, UC Davis requires uh, these diversity statements, as I mentioned, as part of the hiring process for our faculty. And uh, everyone in our campus community is expected to uphold our principles of community. And that means creating a climate of dignity and respect where we celebrate diversity and, and uh, repel all forms of discrimination. And I know you're com com committed to many of these same efforts at Santa Clara University as well. Uh, next, we must develop programs geared specifically for underrepresented students in STEM. I focused on this as a faculty member and dean at Georgia Tech, as, as you heard, and I helped lead a set of programs to increase the number of minority students at that university's uh, graduate programs. Uh, targeted efforts like these can, can lead to great success. In our case, we helped the, uh, the Georgia Tech College of Engineering become the largest and most diverse uh, college of engineering in the United States. One of the programs uh, I led was uh, called uh, Facilitating Academic Careers in Engineering and Science, or FACES. And this purpose was to increase the number of underrepresented STEM PhD recipients at Georgia Tech. And, and over the duration of that program, more than 430 students received PhDs in science or engineering at Georgia Tech. Uh, at that time, that was the most in such fields in the nation and, and led to that presidential award that uh, Tukumbo so kindly mentioned in my introduction. Uh, finally, uh, we must help underrepresented students and colleagues build community. Uh, academic success centers and employee resource groups are good examples of how to do that. As an undergraduate, I found an incredible source of support within the National Society of Black Engineers, as was also mentioned in the introduction. Nesby was kind of a game changer for me. It helped me connect with others who had the same passion for engineering, and we could relate to one another's struggles and feelings of isolation on our campuses. Uh, we were looking for mentors, and we wanted to help others along the way. Nesby was just a um, uh, such an important part of my life. It also led to me finding, finding a wife, which turned out to be important. So, um, mentoring plays a critical role. Um, having a mentor with similar background can be vital to success for our students and our young faculty. Uh, everyone needs some help along the way, and I'm a huge proponent of mentoring. One of my favorite quotes is from Dr. Joyce Lynn Elders, the former US, U.S. Surgeon General, as you see here. Uh, and she said, you can't be what you can't see, simply put, but very profound. Um, in conclusion, uh, you know, I just want to revisit this theme of superheroes for a bit. I'm going to challenge you all to cultivate your own superpowers, and that means using your powers for good, uh, working to make the world a better place, and helping others to succeed. As engineers, we like to build things. We also share the aspiration of building something will, that will outlast us. Buildings, bridges, and dams come to mind immediately to our civil engineers, but I'm referring to something a little more transformative than that. I'm talking about accelerating and advancing innovations that make the world a healthier, safer, and more sustainable place. And over the past 40 years or so, we electrical and computer engineers and computer scientists have been hyper-focused on chasing uh, the insatiable consumer demand for more, better, faster technologies that entertain us and curate our lives on social media. You know, the rate of technological change has accelerated to a point where the, 20, the 2004 birth of Facebook seems like a lifetime ago. And last time I checked, Facebook uh, was nearing about 3 billion users. Uh, and yes, I am one of them. And, and, and by the way, I once had a thousand likes on a post, just saying. Uh, of course, uh, I remember the flip phone and we all remember the flip phone as well. They, they were dumb phones by today's smartphone standards. The, the Commodore 64 of phone technology, if you will. And none of our students know what Commodore 64 that reference means, but uh, we do. Uh, you know, I remember when my iPod was must have music player of choice and, and they're practically extinct now and because our smartphones now double as our music players and many other things. But you get the point here. New technologies have been adopted at a dizzying pace. It seems that there's an endless quest for the newest, shiniest gadget. Uh, but 
here's my great hope for the next generation of engineers that we are training now. I ask that uh, they apply at least as much vigor and ingenuity toward technologies that liberate people from poverty, illness, and suffering that buffer the effects of climate change and help us to adapt to a changing environment. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not dismissing the value of consumer uh, uh, products and entertainment technologies. I love seeing my favorite superheroes come to life on the screen through computer generated imagery, and I like my smartphone as much as the next person. I'm simply hoping that there'll be a time when the public gets just as excited about technologies that better society as they do about those that serve the individual. So I encourage you all to think broadly about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Think of how society benefits when many diverse perspectives work together to find solutions. And most importantly, think about leading by example. That means listening to diverse perspectives or working to recruit diverse faculty and staff. It also could mean using your own gifts to mentor a rising talent. And together, I think we can empower the next and more diverse generation in STEM. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Combo, you are muted. Oh, thank you so much for that presentation. We have two students who are gonna help us with the Q&A session. They are Daniel Mendoza and Edward Obasi. Um, both of them would basically help us to kick off the question and answer session. And if you have questions, please feel free to either put in the chat box, or if you want to ask directly, let, uh, let us know and you can be unmuted so that you can ask your questions directly. So, uh, Daniel, are you ready to go with the first question? I am. Let me go get ahead. that up. Go ahead. So the first question that we have is, how do you see the role of a public research university like UC Davis changing in response to shifting demographics over the next 10 years? And what should universities be doing now to realign curriculum, calendars, and institutional structures to best support future students? That's a great question and something we've been grappling with in the, over the past year, as you can imagine. And I think, you know, the role of public universities is certain, certainly uh, uh, there's a public service uh, aspect to our mission that uh, is incumbent upon us because we take public funds to operate, right? So we have to give uh, some return on that investment that the public makes in us uh, through the state's allocation and through, through taxpayer funding. So I think um, that's one of the motivations behind the Aggie Square project that uh, Tacumbo mentioned in my introduction. That's our new innovation uh, park that we're building in Sacramento. And the idea there is to provide a, a, a mechanism to take our research discoveries from the laboratory to, to the marketplace and to, to the community in a more effective manner. I think that is part of our mission as a, as a public university. And I think, you know, uh, uh, as, if anything, the, the pandemic has taught us the value of university research and science and how that can be uh, beneficial to, to uh, the general public. All the, all the vaccines that have been developed have had some root uh, uh, in, in uh, university research and all the other things that, you know, the, the, from, from uh, uh, rest from the um, um, tests that we're doing to, to detect COVID to um, the ventilators that are used to help the patients uh, uh, and to, to almost anything you think of um, are, uh, have some connection to, to uh, university research. And it's important for us to continue to think about practical use when we do our research, uh, not, not exclusively. I'm still, I still believe in basic research and its value, but I do think we also have, an, have to have an eye and an ear toward uh, the eventual use of what we discover. Thank you. Next question. All right, we have one in the chat from Iris Stewart Frey. She's wondering if you could give us more specifics on the programs that you initiated to increase diversity, especially ones that you found most effective. Well, I've been involved in you know many many programs over the years. Uh, one, the first, very first one I actually participated in developing as a graduate student at Berkeley. You know, it was an undergraduate research program. Uh, had the acronym Superb Summer Undergraduate Program of Engineering Research at Berkeley. But I think many institutions around the country have similar programs now. The idea is students come to the university over the summer and do a research project with a faculty advisor and often a graduate student mentor. And uh, we use it as a recruiting mechanism to get the students to come to Georgia Tech for their graduate studies. And, and um, uh, it was very effective. 
Uh, we had a program uh, called Focus, which was used, uh, which was uh, held over Martin Luther King Holiday Weekend every year. Where we brought a couple hundred students from all over the country to the campus to uh, experience our campus, experience Atlanta and the civil rights movement, and again, uh, hopefully recruit them to, to consider graduate education there. Um, the FACES program I mentioned in my, in my remarks um, was one that was also quite successful. Uh, we have programs we're developing now here at, uh, at UC Davis, um, uh, one that's patterned after focus, which we call Envision UC Davis, where we do the similar thing where we invite uh, currently it's, uh, California residents, but we're going to be expanding as time, time goes on to students from other, uh, uh, other states and other countries. But it's a recruitment mechanism where we bring students from those uh, other parts of the state to UC Davis for a weekend to meet our students, meet our faculty, see our labs, see our campus, and hopefully eventually decide to come here to study with us. I could go on. There's many, many programs that I've been a part of that have been, been effective. Thank you. Next question, Daniel, or anybody? <clears throat> Okay, I have a question. Let me, um, at UC Davis, you recently hired a vice chancellor for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And at Santa Clara University, we're in the process of doing the same thing, a vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion. What can we at Santa Clara learn from your experience and the priorities of that position? Well, the first thing, I'll repeat something I said uh, in my talk. You, with, with that office, you're gonna be tempted to kind of throw everything over the transom and give it to that person to, to solve, problems to solve. But diversity is everyone's job at the university. Uh, from, from Father O'Brien to, to everyone that work, you know, that, uh, the custodians that keep the uh, buildings clean, it's everybody's job. Uh, by the way, fundraising is also everybody's job at the university, but that's another story. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's important that um, uh, to make that office successful, uh, that you recognize that uh, everyone has to contribute and that it's properly resourced. And I would say uh, uh, that person should look for some partnerships around the state and the country uh, because there's lots of good ideas and best practices that, that can be taken advantage of. Thank you. Yeah, hey, Gary's Father O'Brien, question, can you name some of the resistances you get for your work promoting DEI and engineering? Like what yeah. are the common resistances and how do you get beyond them or around them or through them? Yeah, I'll I'll, a recent one, I, I talked about the diversity statements that we make faculty candidates right. Um, there was uh, our academics in it was not fond of that idea when we started. <laughs> so, um, so there was a, a, a fairly public uh, um, op-ed that was written by our, uh, the chair of mathematics here that wound up in the Wall Street Journal criticizing that uh, uh, policy. And uh, we wound up having uh, quite a debate on campus, um, uh, an actual vote by the Academic Senate on whether to continue that practice. Uh, uh, thankfully, the vote turned out in, a, in the way that I hoped it would, and, and we are uh, able to continue. Uh, I had to respond to the uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal with a letter to the editor. I never thought I'd be published in the Wall Street Journal, but I was. And uh, um, so even, you know, today there, you do face opposition to some of these ideas. And I don't think, to be fair, I don't think that the opposition was to, to the idea of diversity. The opposition was to the, um, uh, the perceived notion that uh, we were uh, diluting the faculty evaluation process, right? The faculty candidate evaluation process, which is totally ridiculous, but that was, that was the perception. Thank you. More questions, please, from the audience. I have a question. Um, you mentioned a quote from Jocelyn Elders, you can't be what you can't see, who, by the way, is somehow related to me. So I love to hear that quote. Um, so how can we as students help our administrators to see issues in DEI um, where we see them or as we see them um, in a respectful manner? I think it's important for um, the units of the campus to have student advisory uh, uh, groups or, or whatever mechanism it might be uh, so that you can have uh, these sometimes difficult conversations uh, uh, with your, your, your faculty and your campus leaders about the uh, experience that you're having as a student. Um, I think, uh, you know, I have actually, uh, we actually hire, I have a graduate student advisor, I have two undergraduate student advisors that 
you know, that's their, you know, they get a modest stipend for the whole year to, to bring these issues to my attention um, throughout the year. Uh, that's a model that seems to work reasonably well. But um, the best thing that, that can be done is to find and, and to um, hire more uh, uh, faculty of color so that you can have people that you can see, as Jocelyn Elder said, and that you can envision being. I have a question from the chat. Let's go ahead. How does UC Davis measure the success of their implicit bias trainings for educators? How can universities ensure this anti-bias training process is continued and not a one-time experience for educators? Yeah, so there's many ways. Um, uh, we, <laughs> one sort of uh, practical way is you hope that it reduces the number of complaints that you get for bias <laughs> that your, your various compliance offices have. And so that's an easy way to measure. But also you, you, you like to see that um, uh, the, the, this, the underrepresented faculty are progressing through their careers reasonably well, you know, getting tenure and promoted and all those sorts of things. And, um, uh, and what I, we also do is we make the uh, um, contributions to diversity part of the evaluation, annual evaluation process for campus leaders. So um, when I'm evaluating the vice chancellors that report to me, we talk about what they've done to enhance diversity on the campus. And that's part of their, uh, their own uh, uh, responsibility and, and ends up being part of the, uh, their, their raise or other uh, uh, incentives that they have when we have raises. Thank you. I have a thank question. You. Oh, go ahead. I was just saying thank you, my bad. Thank you. I have a question from the chat room. Uh, was there a faculty member in particular that inspired you and what, what were their characteristics? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, when I was an undergraduate at Georgia Tech, there was only one um, uh, a black professor in engineering on the campus. His name was Augustine Essaboy, a uh, Nigerian professor of industrial and systems engineering. Um, by the way, he was the first PhD in that field, I think in the, in the world. Um, uh, and uh, he was also the advisor to our Nesby chapter. So he and I became close. He was a father figure to me, still a, a wonderful, great friend, but he was also a mentor, somebody that I could look at and envision and, and see myself. You know, I'd always envisioned success as, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an actor or an athlete, or, you know, I'd never seen uh, a as successful uh, African-American or uh, black person in engineering or, or a professor uh, in engineering. So. Uh, that was really critical for me to be able to observe that and say, hey, I could, be, and he told me, you can do that, you could be that. And that was, that was an important inflection point in my career. Thank you. Talking about mentoring, um, it's very important to have good mentors. And is there a mechanism you would suggest for Santa Clara students to ensure that every student is effectively mentored throughout their process, their career? Yeah, we actually, you know, you, you can, uh, similar to what I was saying about evaluation, we, you can uh, look at uh, effective mentoring as, a, as one of the things, uh, one of the metrics that you look at uh, when evaluating, not just faculty, uh, staff as well. Um, and we can accept that um, by, we uh, provide uh, awards for best mentor, mentee uh, uh, pairs or, or groups. Um, that's something I found effective uh, when I was a dean. We had a, a, an award for the best mentor-mentee pair. It was a cash award, so that gets people's attention. And it also lets people know that we're, we're, we're looking at that, we're paying attention to that. So those are a couple of ways to do that. Okay. More questions, please, from the audience? Yeah, please go ahead, Elaine. Hi. Um, way back when, we have a common person that we have in common was, which, who was Wayne Clough. And yeah. I was at Virginia Tech and um, in, I hate to say how long ago it was, but 90 or 90, uh, 92, I guess, um, the year I was hired, it was a very diverse, he was Dean of Engineering at that point, and it was a very diverse uh, class of you know, incoming faculty. Mm -hmm. And I always have admired that. And um, I just wanted to you know, have you comment on some of the ways he, approach things and how he influenced you at Georgia Tech. Yeah, thanks, Elaine. So, so Wayne um, was president of Georgia Tech um, for about 14 years. And in the same way that uh, Professor Essaboy uh, enabled me to envision myself as a, as a faculty member, Wayne 
mentored me and enabled, enabled me to envision myself as a university leader. So um, he had a program, uh, it wasn't a formal program, but he had a, uh, basically an apprenticeship where he would select uh, someone he thought had potential to be a leader to be essentially his chief of staff. And I was fortunate to be selected uh, uh, at one point in my career, 2002, I think it was, and did that for three years. And, the, and you learned from him. He was such a model statesman and, and uh, fundraiser and, and um, communicator and all these things that you want to be as, as a university leader. And uh, again, well, this is one of these inflection points in my career, being able to learn from him on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're still very close. He, by the way, um, he's, he's not, as, as Elaine knows, he's not a person of color. Uh, he just was a person with a generous spirit who uh, wanted to do the right thing and uh, was helpful to me and, and countless others uh, in their careers. And um, we're still quite close. And he was the person I invited to UC Davis to come speak when I was uh, at my investiture uh, as chancellor. Uh, so uh, he was the keynote speaker. After he left Georgia Tech, he went to become the, the secretary of the Smithsonian. So um, he did that for, for another, you know, I don't know, seven or eight years uh, until he retired and he's living back in Atlanta now. Thank you. I have a question from the chat room. Do you measure students who switch out of STEM fields into other fields? And are there any tips for reducing the number of students who complete their degrees but switch out of STEM? We do measure that. Of course, we like for students who start in STEM to stay there, but you know, everyone has changes of heart and may you know, find something more interesting or find their passion is different. And that's totally fine. We, we just wanna make sure they do graduate in some field uh, uh, at our university, hopefully. Um, but uh, we do measure uh, uh, retention in the STEM fields. Um, uh, I, I think the, the important thing is for students who are considering it is to have uh, some ex experiences that allow them to explore and experience STEM. So these summer camps and summer experiences are, are critical uh, because they allow you to do a project or work with a, another uh, engineering student or, or faculty member and really find where your passion lies. And, and if you, and it's okay to, to, to find out the things you don't wanna do as it is to find the things as, as, as important as it is to find the things you do wanna do, but to, to try to identify that passion and, and pick that uh, major, if you will, and stay, stick with it um, because the, the benefits and, uh, are, are pretty significant. Thank you very much. There's another question from the chat room. How do you hold the community accountable for advancing the diversity, equity, and inclusion goals of your institution? Yeah, so I, uh, we have a strategic plan uh, that for which diversity, equity, inclusion is one of the five major objectives for the university. And then we have a DEI strategic plan, which is in kind of a subset of the overall university strategic plan that has specific metrics and, and milestones. And the accountability comes when we, we don't, when we, when we measure against those milestones, um, as I mentioned, just when I'm evaluating uh, uh, individuals, we evaluate departments. Uh, and when we allocate resources, we ask these questions to those, those departments and colleges and schools uh, and, and how they're doing in these goals. And if they are you know, not meeting their targets or, or having issues that affects their resource allocation. Hmm. I guess some of them may not like that <laughs> policy. But it wasn't popular. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can imagine. <laughs> um, there's another question in the chat room. Would like to have more details or comment about collaborations with employee resource groups. Um, the person says, when I was president of AT&T, um, San Ramon chapter, we partnered with AT&T External Affairs, uh, UFW families with college students. We provided leadership training Coral Foundation nano degree from Udacity for STEM career path and led Hasimo's mentors to explain how a business plan worked to respond to a business challenge. I think the, the gist of the question is just to get more details about how you collaborate with your employee resource group, if you can answer. Well, you know, we just think we encourage uh, our staff to consider forming such groups and we try to give them uh, proper resources that they might need. Uh, I have advisory committees from those groups. Uh, there's a women's group, there's an African-American employees group, there's um, Asian and Pacific Islander group, there's various other uh, Latinx group. Um, and um, we, we, we try to make sure there's open communication with those groups and we allow uh, to have 
uh, all the um, activities and, and, and when we're back to having activities with each other again um, and try to support those as best we can because right? those are important for building community as I mentioned in the talk and um, uh, uh, it allows uh, folks to have a sense of uh, support uh, support system for, for uh, people that have similar backgrounds. Thank you. I have a question. Um, Go ahead, please. If you don't mind, um, switching gears a bit onto your research and racial bias in AI. Um, I think you mentioned that a little bit earlier, but do you mm -hmm. think there should be legislation preventing the use of AI and machine learning for criminal or criminal or other um, issues unless AI is validated and as non-biased as possible? Yeah. So first, let me say that's not my research. That's some research I've read about and 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 uh, uh, shared with you, but it's not my own research. Uh, so there's some complex uh, legal and ethical and policy questions there that probably need to be debated by people that are experts in those fields. But I do think uh, what I would say is uh, we need to make those technical tools better and, and more accurate. And, and studies such as the ones I described are opening up our eyes to, to some of the problems that will enable us to make them better from a technical standpoint. Uh, and, when, and when we make them free of bias, then, then they, they certainly should be used for the, for the purpose that um, that they were intended. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about what you said earlier. You said that when you graduated, there were only like 30 people with a PhDs in that year. Yeah. Do you know what the number is now? That's the first question. <laughs> yeah, so the number now, it ranges typically around 120 to 150. Okay. Uh, uh, that's, that's black engineering PhD graduates in the US. Yeah, that's the typical number. Now, that's still not the same as a percentage of the population, overall population. No, no, it's not far from it. Yeah. <laughs> so that creates a pipeline problem because we right. don't have enough people graduating that can fill any jobs that are open in academia or in industry. That's right. How do we fill that pipeline? Well, you, you, you continue to fill the pipeline by uh, properly you know, uh, funding uh, uh, the types of programs that I described that we developed. And, um, you don't wait until the pipeline is filled to start uh, uh, having a d diversity programs. I think uh, you would you would certainly like to have uh, a, a faculty population that reflects uh, um, um, the demographics of, of, of uh, the society, but you're not going to get there immediately. So, uh, as an alternative, uh, it's important to to educate uh, the entire. Uh, faculty about these issues. And that's one of the reasons for these diversity statements that we encourage or require, because you don't necessarily have to be a person who's developed a faceless program to be a faculty member, but you should have some, you should have thought about these issues, right? You're gonna be educating um, a population in California that's so diverse. You should have thought about how you're gonna, um, uh, how you're gonna re respond pedagogically to this kind of population in your classroom. It's not too much to ask for you to have thought about how to best uh, educate, empower, and train these students. Thank you. Um, there's one more question on the chat room. Are you innovating in teaching and grading to be more inclusive of diversity? Uh, there are people here that are studying that. Uh, I'm not personally involved in in that uh, field, but yes, yeah, sure. In our in our uh, School of Education, that's a, a rich field of research for, for, and also we have a Center for Educational Effectiveness uh, where th these types of things are being studied and debated and, and uh, scholarly papers are being produced. So yeah, that's, a, that's an active area of, of scholarship here at UC Davis. Thank you. Please, I think I'm out of questions from the okay. chat room. So <laughs> I want to open up to anybody else who has a question, please feel free. And if the students have questions, please feel free as well to ask the questions right now. Yeah, I have a quick question. Go ahead, um, does faculty unionization um, play a role in, in pushing forward DEI in a campus setting? Uh, I hadn't actually thought of that, to be honest. Uh, I suppose it could. Um, you know, we, we have not connected those two things here as of yet, but I suppose um, there could be some, some overlap or some synergy. Our, our, uh, uh, we have unionized instructors. We don't have unionized uh, uh, Senate faculty. Um, uh, and um, many of the issues that come up in, in the labor discussions 
are more around uh, ensuring that diversity exists as opposed to, uh, and, and, and properly, um, uh, and, and those people are properly compensated as opposed to the whole idea of promoting in, 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 uh, in uh, more diversity, at least as far as I know, I haven't been in such discussions, but I think it's an interesting idea to think about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. More questions? I have one. What yes, was please. your hardest obstacle in getting through graduate school to obtain your PhD in your academic career? And how did you overcome that obstacle? Uh, you know, graduate school, uh, this I think is true for many of us. It's such a mysterious open-ended process. The hardest part was trying to figure out what I had to do to get to the end, right? So, um, uh, and, and it's, uh, you know, somewhat subjective as well. It's up to your, your advisor and your committee. The, when they say that you've done enough and that you're ready to uh, leave the nest. Um, so I guess that was the most kind of unnerving part for me is not having a clear defined, you know, milestone for, for completion. But, you know, you, 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 uh, you, I got through it fine. And, and the person who asked the question, you will too. Okay. Or was that you, Abbasi, that was asking the question? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you. <laughs> That's very good. Thank you so much. Um, any last question before we wrap up the program? Anybody wants to go last? If not, then let's give, oh, did I get another question? No. Let's give a round of applause to Chancellor May, please. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Father O'Brien for coming and for, in, for this active engagement with our speaker. I want to thank the provost. She had to leave early. Uh, thank you, Dean Elaine, for coming. And thank you all the faculty, staff, and students who have attended this inaugural uh, lecture. Um, there are a lot of students that helped us put this together. Two of them are here today, and some of them are watching online, and some are the ideas uh, group members, and also NSBE members who contributed to this program. But first and foremost, I want to like thank the, the staff members. Uh, Ricardo Padilla has been very, very helpful. He put up the whole Zoom, Zoom uh, Thing and then we had several meetings with him and his group. And uh, Nicole Morales, Heidi Williams, they were very, very helpful. Um, of course, Daniel Mendoza is here, Edward Obasi Lewis, and the other students who have helped. Your efforts are very much appreciated. Um, as part of this program, we'll be soliciting suggestions for future speakers in this series. If you have any suggestions, please feel free to send that to me, and we will um, hopefully. Uh, organize or pick, select somebody and then have a similar event like this next quarter. So the next event will be sometime in spring quarter. We'll, we'll get you uh, guys informed. Stay tuned for that. And finally, we want to just thank you again for coming and have a great spring break. Good luck on your final exams. And we'll see you again in the spring. And let's give another round of applause to Chancellor May. I appreciate your time. and effort. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>